Hello friends, this is John Lomakang. Thank you for joining us here at 3ABN Sabbath School panel. This entire quarter we've been talking about the promise, the new covenant life, the life that we have in Christ Jesus. And that covenant has covered a number of topics from the fall of man to the exile of the children of Israel to their freedom to the re-ratifying of that covenant through giving the commandments of God. But today we're going to be talking about the new covenant life. You know, many people think that we have to wait till we get to heaven to enjoy life. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we're going to end this quarter study on a high note, how you can have joy in Christ, not waiting till heaven, but having that joy now. If you'd like to follow us, you can get a lesson by going to absg.adventist.org, download a copy, or you can go to your local Seventh-day Adventist church and join them in a hands-on study. But we prefer that you join us here as we take the time to make Christ real to you. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I cannot believe it, but this is lesson number 13 for the second quarter. And we've been covering the promise, God's everlasting covenant. And we have been really working through some difficult passages in the Bible. Abraham has been one of the central themes, but Christ is always the supreme theme of the issue of salvation and redemption. And today we have a family that's rearing to go, so let me go ahead and introduce those family members to you. To my immediate left is our COO and Vice President, Jill, good to have you here today. Thank you, Pastor John, privileged to be here. I have a question, do you have a list? There's a list, oh, three things. Good to have you. <laughs> and somebody sneaked in on us, Jason Bradley, <laughs> head of Dear to Dream Network. Good to have you here, Jason. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing what all of you are going to share today. Okay. And the lady with many hats, the lady from Texas, the state uh, of Texas, right. Shelly Quinn. Good to have you here, Shelly. Thank you. It's such a privilege to study with you. And if I call him at 2.30 in the morning, he'll be ready to sing. Ryan Day, Pastor. Good Amen. Day. Blessing. Blessing to be here. Good. We are going to talk about, <coughs> my lesson is going to be about joy. Mm. About joy. But in order to have joy, let's begin with prayer. Jason, would you start with prayer for us? Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity and privilege of studying your word, Lord. And we thank you for the joy that comes with it. And Lord, I just ask that you would guide this study today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I, I just really appreciate the fact that the writer of this lesson had highlighted, even though uh, Dr. Gerhard Hazel is deceased, this compilation has been so wonderfully put together to uh, commemorate his works, and he's been a man who's established such a credible approach to Bible prophecy, understanding the Old Covenant in a beautiful way. But I love the fact that this one is saying, okay, we have gone through the legalistic aspects of it, the legitimate uh, walks through the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, but what about the joy in all of it? And that's something that we have to keep in mind, and the memory text really highlights that joy, John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Look at the segue. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Let me make it very clear from the very beginning. You will never really experience true joy, guiltless joy until you turn your life over to Jesus. The joy at his right hand is a guiltless joy. It's a joy that continues growing. And if we can have that much joy in Christ in this life, just imagine what kind of joy we're going to have when he unfolds to us the untold secrets of the limitless billions of galaxies and worlds that are unknown. I'm looking forward to that because if in this sinful society we can have technology like iPads and iPhones and can communicate in the frail inventions of humanity, just imagine, the Apostle Paul says, I have not seen nor ear heard. So we are going to go ahead and try to highlight and give you a glimpse, an internal glimpse of the faithful glory and the joy that we can have in Christ. The writer also brought out the point that though the outcome of the grand finale of the covenant promise is, of course, eternal life in the world made new, these points are brought out so well. He says, we don't have to wait for eternity to enjoy the covenant blessings. We can enjoy those covenant blessings today. Right, yeah. Shelley? The Lord cares about our lives now. He wants the best for us when? Now. now. My wife, one of my wife's favorite words. The covenant is not some deal where you do this and that and this and that then. 
and a long way off, wait for the blessings to come, we can have the blessings of the new covenant right now. The rewards, the gifts, they are blessings that those who by faith enter into the covenant relationship can enjoy now. When the Lord says, I will supply all of your need according to my riches and glory, you'll never really know what that means unless you enter into that covenant relationship with God. The lesson also points out that the final in our series looks at some of these immediate blessings, some of the promises that come from God's grace shed into our hearts because having heard him knock, Revelation 3, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If we open that door, he will not only come in and sup with us, have fellowship, but he'll begin to unfold to us the mysteries of his salvation, the glories of redemption, and the willingness to have us as children of the eternal God by his side forevermore. I'm looking forward to the day. I don't know about you guys. I know Jason loves to eat, so I could say this is true about Jason for sure, but I'm looking forward to the day when we can sit down at the welcome table. Yeah. If my wife can cook that good, just imagine what the Lord is going to unfold before us. And you know, you've eaten my wife's food before. Those are blessings we look forward to, but God has given us glimpses in his word. But the question that I'd like to segue into that in 1 John 1 and verse 4, here are the questions that we'd like to think about when we move in that direction. Why should we feel joy? Why should we feel joy in a world that's filled with sorrow and sadness and death and suffering and hardship and disease on every side and pandemic and the list goes on and on. Why should the Christian feel joy? On what basis can we claim that promise of joy? What is it about the covenant that should free us from the burden of guilt? And what does it mean to have a new heart and a new experience in Christ now? 1 John 1 verse 4, we read these words of the apostle. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Full joy. Not partial joy but that your joy may be full. And the apostle that wrote this understood the challenges of being persecuted for righteousness sake. But one of the greatest advantages of those who know that their joy can be full, he made it clear, the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. One of the great advantages is we as the covenant people of God, we know that the promise that God has given to us is amen and it's true and it's hallelujah. Whatever the Lord promises is true. As Christians, we are often told not to go by feelings. Faith is not a feeling and that we need to get beyond our feelings, all of which is true to some degree. But at the same time, we would not be human beings if we didn't have feelings or if we did not have emotions or if we did not have moods or as in some people's case, mood swings from one side to the other. God has given us the ability to smile, to laugh, to shed a tear, to be excited, to be joyful, that's right. and with too much chocolate, to be cynical, <laughs> <laughs> in which we know that what that's all about. But we cannot deny our feelings. We need to do, what we need to do is understand them, give them their proper role as much as possible, but also keep our feelings and our emotions under righteous control. So Jill, here are nine things that can be the foundation of our joy. I think you might have a six or seven, but I don't know if you've ever had nine. But let's look at these nine things. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28, verse 47 and 48. When Israel chose not to serve God, we're going to begin with a downer and then start, end with an upper. When Israel chose not to serve God in joy, they received his displeasure. And listen to what the Bible says. This is the reason why we should worship God with great joy. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47 because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. That's a sad chapter. What is being said there is the Lord said, wait a minute, didn't I free you from Egypt? Didn't I give you everything you asked me for, but you wouldn't even worship me in joy and gladness of heart? So I'm going to go ahead and return you to the prior state until you get to the place where, as in Hosea, I'm going to go back to my husband, to my Lord, because it was better with me then than it is with me now. Joy was spoken of as an expression of our worship. First Chronicles 15, verse 16. The Bible says, Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to a 
appoint their brethren to be the singers of Orion, accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, and cymbals, by raising the voice with resounding joy. If you're going to worship the Lord, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Nothing is worse or more diabolical than a humdrum, drone-filled, sad expression of worship. If the Lord has done anything to you, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen, somebody. Number three, a life that does not face the blessings of repentance is robbed of the joys that's found in Christ. Psalm 51, verse 8, David prayed this prayer after his transgression. Look what he prayed for. Psalm 51, verse 8 and verse 12, Make me hear the joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. David fell before the Lord in repentance, and he said in verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Well, let's go on further. The cleansing of one's heart also result, results in joy. Psalm 126 and verse 5. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Sometimes you got to cry before you can rejoice. Sometimes you have to go through the darkness of night before the joy of morning comes. Number five, when we abide in the presence of God, we will find genuine joy. Psalm 16 and verse 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is what? Fullness of joy, and at your right hand are what? Pleasures forevermore. I'm looking forward to that. Number six, Psalm 5 and verse 11. When we trust in God, we discover there is no greater joy. The Bible says, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. You know, friends, right now you can have joy in Christ. You don't have to wait until the clouds clear and the sun comes out, especially if you live in the Northeast where it gets cloudy and foggy most of the year. But I tell you, as you begin to move through the year as we're doing now, you begin to discover as the clouds dissipate, you'll find as the saying goes, behind every cloud there's a silver what? Lining, and that's the joy of God that is never absent. Number seven, do not be afraid to face temporary pain because joy is eternal. The Apostle Paul, Romans 8, verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's going to be tough, but one day it's going to be good, or as one young man said, gooder than ever before. And we're looking forward to that day. Number eight, joy looks beyond the here and now to the hereafter and the days ahead of us. Second Timothy 1 verse 12, for this reason I also suffer these things. And nevertheless, he said, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. The apostle Paul says, I know it's tough. I'm about to die, but I'm looking beyond the here and now to the day that's ahead of me. And number nine, the words, the testament of the Apostle Paul before he left the scene. Joy looks beyond the cross to the crown. Second Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, he said, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, who friends? The Lord, the righteous judge will give me on that day. And listen to his ending words. And not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. Praise God for that. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. I love those nine points. The joy we have, the joy we can have here and now as part of the new covenant life. My lesson on Monday is guilt free, meaning as part of the covenant life, you and I can live guilt free. I've divided my lesson into three sections. So here's the three sections and then we'll unpack them. Section one is feeling guilty. Section two is being guilty. Section three, living guilt free. So let's start with feeling guilty. Since Adam and Eve, remember Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the garden. There was no guilt. There was no shame. There was nothing that separated them from God. <clears throat> when sin entered, there came guilt 
there came fear, there came separation from God and their Redeemer, their Maker. Ever since that time, guilt has been a part of this world because sin brings guilt. Now, I think some people maybe feel guiltier than others. Maybe it's due to personality. Some people naturally might feel more guilty. Sometimes it's due to the hardening of the heart toward evil, and the harder your heart becomes, maybe the less guilt you might feel. I think about before the flood, Genesis 6, 5, what does the Word of God say? The thoughts of their mind were only evil continually. So I'm not sure. I'm sure they had some twinges of guilt, but maybe not as much guilt as someone else. But we all know what guilt feels like. Our cat, all I have to do is snap my fingers, and she knows she did something wrong, and she better get herself in line. You think of the child when their hand's in the cookie jar and mama comes. What are you doing with your hand in the cookie jar? The child knows I wasn't supposed to do that. They know that feeling of guilt. <clears throat> I think of an adult. Maybe if they stole something or if they lied about a neighbor or a coworker. Maybe they're sleeping with someone who's not their spouse. That feeling of guilt. There's a certain segment of the population we don't really consider has that feeling of guilt. That might be the serial killer. We might consider a lot of them might not even feel guilt. I read an article, this was published in 2017. It says remorse is rare for serial killers, but it can happen. And they mentioned one person who actually was in prison for being a serial killer. And they actually hung themselves in their cell. And they left behind a note that it said, I made a deal with myself. I would come back and take responsibility for every evil act I committed in life. If these people are not alive, I should not be allowed to live either. Feeling a sense of guilt. And why is that? That leads us to section two, because they are guilty. We feel that guilt because we have transgressed the law of God. If you look at Romans 1, 2, and 3, Romans chapter 1 talks about the sins of the Gentiles or the sins of those who do not know God. It's a huge list of sins if you look at Romans 1. In verse 32, it says, Those who practice such things, this entire list of sins, are deserving of death. Why are they deserving of death? We know Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Romans 1 is all about the sins of the Gentiles or the sins of those who do not know, walk in covenant relationship with God. But unless you think the Christians are left out or the Jewish people are left out, we get to Romans 2 and Paul enumerates the sins of the Jewish people. Especially verse 1, Romans 2, 1, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For when in whatever way you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And jump down to verse 24, Romans 2, 24. He says, The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So because of people who claim the name of Christ because of Christians, in this case it was Jews, but we could say us today as Christians, because they do not walk the talk, because they do not live as Christians, it blasphemes the name of God. By the time we get to Romans 3.23, it just says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm so thankful the Word of God, it doesn't stop there. We don't have to live feeling with that guilt. We don't have to know that we are guilty. We can live guilt-free. So let's look at that. Three keys to how you can live guilt-free. Key number one, accept Christ's forgiveness for your sins. Key number one is to accept it. First John 1, 9. I remember our precious Miss Molly Steenson used to quote this verse probably every single Sabbath school panel, right, Shelley? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Accept what God's word says about you by faith, not by how you feel. Don't wait until you feel better. Don't wait until you think God has forgiven you. 
feelings can be fickle and feelings can be changing. Accept what his word says. It says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will bring you back into covenant relationship with himself. We're not Christians by how we feel. We are Christians because of what God's word says about us. God's word says you are forgiven. God's word says that you can be his child. God's word says that he can transform you. God's forgiveness, Christ's forgiveness is instantaneous. Christ's forgiveness is complete. Christ's forgiveness requires no goodness on our behalf. But Christ's forgiveness is dependent on you and I asking for it. Otherwise, everybody in the world would be forgiven. We need to ask, we need to confess our sins. Then he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all <clears throat> unrighteousness. I love 1 John 1, 9 because it talks about two aspects of Christ's work in our life. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's aspect number one, that justification process. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the sanctification process. So the first key is we just accept Christ's forgiveness for our sins. The second key is we allow him to exchange his garment of righteousness for our filthiness. Turn with me to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3, I love this analogy. <clears throat> Zechariah 3, this is of course Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and he is clothed in filthy garments. Zechariah 3 verse 4, then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying, take away the filthy garments from him. Now those filthy garments were representative of sin. You and I stand before God and we are clothed in filthy garments. Now the word filthy, Jason, in Hebrew literally means to soil from excrement. So this is pretty bad. This is filthy garments. And to him he said, I have removed your iniquity from you. I've taken off those filthy mm -hmm. garments and I will clothe you with rich robes, cover you. The minute we accept Christ, the minute we say, will you forgive me? He forgives us and we are clothed in his white righteous robe. That's that double imputation I talked about a couple uh, weeks ago. Second Corinthians 5, 21, he made him, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So my sin is credited or pushed on Jesus. He bore it on the cross. And his righteousness is credited to my account. The third key is to allow him to empower you to live a righteous life. This is that cleansing us from all unrighteousness. It reminds me of Romans 8, 1. Let's look at that scripture, Romans 8, verse 1. Remember in Romans 7, there's this whole controversy in the Christian's life saying, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. We get to Romans 8, verse 1, and it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, the difference the Holy Spirit makes in the life of the believer, that imparted righteousness of Christ, that is Christ in us the hope of glory that is you and I being crucified with Christ and we're not the ones living but it is Christ who lives in us Romans 8 13 if you live according to the flesh you're gonna die but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live you and I don't have to feel guilty you and I don't have to be guilty because we can live guilt free because of Jesus Christ amen Jill wow home run Praise the Lord for that thought-provoking as well as life-empowering message. But don't go away. We have a lot more to come. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to our Sabbath School panel. We're going to go now to Tuesday. Uh, Jason Bradley has New Covenant and New Heart. Mm -hmm. In today's lesson, we're going to witness the world's most impactful heart transplant. As you stated, it's the new covenant and new heart. And we'll begin by looking at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Now, you may want to jot these verses down because we're going to go through them rather rapidly. 
Uh, again, that's Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And the word of God says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now you may be asking, what is the new covenant? And I'm so glad that you asked that question. You see, in Jeremiah chapter 31 through uh, verse 31 through 33, it describes it so beautifully. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. When you get married and exchange wedding vows, you don't have to keep consulting your wedding vows because they're written in your heart, right, oh, married that's people? Good. Mm -hmm. that's good. I'm, like ju that. I'm just coaching, I'm not married. <laughs> Um, they're written in your heart. You know you shouldn't cheat on your husband or wife. You know that he or she should be a priority in your life. You know that you shouldn't steal from them. You shouldn't kill them. You shouldn't lie to them. But you should have an unforgettable time set aside for them. As with any form of progress, there is a process. And in Desire of Ages, page 176, Ellen White speaks about the process of transformation, and she says this, The cross reveals the love of God. If we do not resist, we shall be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that have crucified the Savior. Then the Spirit of God through faith produces a new life in the soul. The thoughts and desires are brought into obedience to the will of Christ. The heart, the mind are created anew in the image of him who works in us to subdue all things to himself. Mm -hmm. Then the law of God is written in the mind and heart. What a beautiful process. We're not even the ones doing the heavy lifting. God is. In our text for today, Paul stressed the element of love, saying that we must be rooted and grounded in it. When we look at a plant, we see the outward appearance and the fruit that's being produced or the lack thereof. Underneath the soil lies the roots that act as an anchor and support the plant body. Now, the primary function of the roots is to absorb water and dissolve minerals from the soil. This function plays a vital role in helping in the process of photosynthesis. Now the word photosynthesis, and I'm going to journey into an area where I don't normally go, which is Greek, is derived from the Greek words phos and synthesis. Phos means light and synthesis means combining together. This means combining together with the help of light. There are a couple factors that affect photosynthesis, but we're going to focus on two of them, and that's light intensity and pollution. Increased light intensity results in a higher rate of photosynthesis. And John chapter 8, verse 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now let's go to pollution. Pollutants and other particles may settle on the leaf's surface. This can block the pores of the stomata, which makes it difficult to take in carbon dioxide. Are there any pollutants in your life that may be blocking you from receiving the word of God? Now is a good time for us to take a look at our lives and ask God to clean up any pollution that we may have. Now why do we need a new heart? Well, let's take a look at the physical heart for a moment. The heart is at the center of the circulatory system. Its job is to pump blood throughout the body. The blood carries important nutrients and, and oxygen that all body organs need. 
The bad thing about the blood is it can also carry diseases. So if we're consuming foods, as we were speaking about food earlier, if we're consuming foods that are nutrient deprived, we're not going to have good blood. Now, our bodies can't provide nutrients that we didn't feed it, right? So the same is true with our spiritual lives. If we aren't feasting on the word of God, then we're left with nutrient deprived blood. Our blood has been marred by a fatal disease called sin, and we need a heart transplant. We need the new heart that Christ wants to give us. Look at what God wants to do for us in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. Again, that's Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So what changes will be manifested in those who have a new heart? In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, the Apostle Paul writes, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. With a new heart, we will walk as children of light, exemplifying practical godliness and the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. With a new heart, we will abide in love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. With a new heart, we will walk in wisdom. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. As the lesson so gracefully points out, with a new heart, our lives are changed. Our thoughts are changed, our desires are changed, and our goals are changed. Do you want to be a new creation? Do you want old things to pass away? Well, we know where to go. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The pledge of, a new of the new covenant is progress is a process. So begin the journey today. A new start will bring a new heart with Christ along the way. Woohoo! You nailed that one too. Praise God. I have Wednesday, the new covenant and eternal life. Do you know what the word juxtaposition means? It's when you've got two contrasting truths that are placed closely together. Let me show you two juxtapositions in Scripture. There's many more, but John 3, 14, or 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. Here's the juxtaposition but have everlasting life. The word perish means to destroy completely. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that they would not perish. Here's the opposing truth, but have everlasting life. Romans 6, 23, another great example of a juxtaposition. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Two contrasting truths, perish 
or have eternal life. Mm -hmm. Death or have the uh, eternal life in Christ Jesus. Satan's lie, his first lie to humanity was, you will not surely die, and he's still right. preaching it. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was writing a book and my sister called me, I kept telling her, I don't have time to talk, but she called anyway. So I would just read her every day. I'd write a new chapter in the book. I'd read it to her. So one day she called and I'm reading along and I get to John 5, 28 and 29. It was in the book and these are Christ's words. He said, do not marvel at this for the day is coming when all who are in their graves will hear my voice and some will come forth, those who have gone, done good. Well, they're all going to come forth in one or two resurrections. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. My sister says to me, I keep reading and she says, wait a minute, wait a minute, go back to that. And she says, what do you mean? All who are in their graves are gonna hear the voice. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, death is asleep and I'm explaining things to her, what the Bible says. And she goes, what, what? I hate you every time I talk to you. I'm learning something that I didn't believe when I came up and she was so mad at me. And I said, just get out your concordance, go through and look up okay. death, look up sleep. And she just says, I'll never talk to you again. Bang, and she hangs up on me. I knew she was very melodramatic. About eight hours later, she calls me back. You know what she says? Oh, you're right, death is asleep. There's no question about it. She'd been studying that whole time and just got into the Word and found that out. See, the Bible tells us in, in 1 Timothy 6.16, only God has immortality now. We are not immortal, but the will of God, Jesus said in John 6, 40, is that everyone who sees the Son and believes Him will have everlasting life. When do we get this everlasting eternal life? Well, Jesus said, I will raise them up on the last day. The first, there's two different resurrections in the Bible. The first resurrection is the righteous. When Jesus comes down with the sound of the trumpet and he calls forth and it says that the dead in Christ will rise first. This is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And then we who are alive will be caught up in the air, joining them and this is at the last trump. That's the first resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54 also explains the first resurrection. And Paul says it this way. He says, hey, I'll tell you a mystery. We're not all going to sleep. We're not all going to die is what he is saying. But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, right. when at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. Right. When at the last trumpet. But now let's talk about this, this, um, Second resurrection. You see, the, the devil told Adam and Eve, you won't die. Well, they did die. They got blocked from the access to the tree of life. They died physically. We all die physically unless we're among the people. Well, there's been a couple that have been caught up to heaven. But the point is that biological death, what's, what's certain taxes and death, right? Mm -hmm unless you're alive when Jesus returns. So what does he mean about the second resurrection and the second death? Did you know the Bible talks about the second death four different times? In Revelation 20, verse 6, he says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. That's the resurrection of the righteous. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this first resurrection, we go to heaven. 
and would get to reign for a thousand years and after that would come back down to earth when the new Jerusalem comes and God recreates the earth, right? Mm -hmm. But what is the second death? This is interesting. Mm -hmm. Revelation 2.11 says, He who overcomes will not be harmed by the second death. Revelation 21.8 says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You are either going to be granted immortality when you put on immortality, at that first resurrection and you're going to have the gift of eternal life or guess what? You're going to perish. There's going to be a second death. God destroyed the world once with the, a lake of water. The next time it's going to be a lake of fire and all who are in that lake of fire are going to be dead, gone eternally. Let me read this to you. In uh, Malachi 4.1, it's, he, it says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. What's that's, that's right. stubble's what's left after the fire. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. And he goes on in verse 3 and says, Hey, you're going to trample on the wicked. They're just going to be ashes under your feet. That sounds like total destruction. That sounds like... You're either going to perish or you're going to have eternal life. Jesus said, and here's where our lesson begins, <laughs> is John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's talking to Martha, her brothers in the, in the tomb. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. See, God came down in the person of Jesus Christ. He became a human to unite himself with us. He paid the penalty for our sin. And you know what? The grave couldn't hold him. No, he had life in himself. He was right. resurrected. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he will give eternal life at the last trumpet right. to all who believe in him. He says, I am the true vine. He will give new covenant eternal life to all who are united in him. There are two dimensions of new covenant life in Christ. The present, that's John 10.10, 10, mm -hmm. that he came to give us abundant life. But then the future is the true eternal life, the promise of the resurrection of being changed from mortal to immortal. And even though that's in the future, that's the one. That's the one that makes everything worth it. To know that whatever we suffer right now is nothing it's temporary. It's nothing compared to the eternal glory of living face to face with our Savior. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What a joy to know that our life, if we're in Christ, in that new covenant relationship, it doesn't end in the grave. Mm. Woo well, she, they started the fire, so I got to continue on. Praise the Lord. I'm so excited. you got to pray for that clock right now because this, this last subject here, Thursday's lesson, New Covenant and Mission. This is, this, is the, this is the fuel for the machine right here. I love evangelism. I love the mission of the church. I love the commission that Christ has given us. And I believe with all my heart and mind that that is where we are today. We need to be, uh, we need to be preaching the gospel. We need to be getting this message out because Jesus is coming soon. So let's go to Matthew chapter 28. We've got to start there. Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to read the last two verses of that chapter. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And this is what the Bible says. Of course, this is the words of Christ. And he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit 
teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Christ is, he simply gave the commission. It's this, it's this beautiful farewell address as he's about to leave and he's about to depart. One of the last things he said to them is go, go tell them everything that I've taught you. Go share with them the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. Go tell them of the good news about how they have a savior, a savior that has come and died for them, a savior who has given his life for them so that they might live eternally. Go out there and tell them this good news. And, we, and what, what, what is the church doing today? Well, some of us are given that message. Some of us are not. And that's why we have these type of studies to remind us of what our mission is. The lesson brings out here at the very beginning, uh, the writer says, All over the world, people often struggle with what South African writer Lawrence Vanderpost called the burden of meaninglessness. People find themselves, he writes, with, or this is actually, I don't know if this is a man or a woman, so I don't know if Lawrence Vander Post is a man or a woman, so I'll just say they write that uh, people find themselves with the gift of life, yet they do not know what to do with it do not know what the purpose of this gift is and do not know how to use it. It is like giving someone a library filled with rare books only to have the person not read the books but use them to build fires. What a terrible waste of something so precious. And I have to agree, we have this amazing, powerful message that Christ has bestowed upon us. And some of us, we have this precious treasure that we're supposed to be sharing with everyone. He said, go, go share it. Go give this beautiful message to as many people as possible because I'm going to return and I'm coming for a whole wheat people, a transformed people, a people who are not, not a part of that you know, processed and refined worldly group, but we're talking about a people who are on fire for the Lord. Jesus is coming back for a church. In fact, this might, reminds me of a little bit of a story that I heard. I've, give, I've used this in sermons before, but I've got to use it right now because it's just perfect. It's a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about this because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. <laughs> I love it. And that's the truth. If I never heard it, it also reminds me of that beautiful song that Lanny Wolf wrote years ago. I grew up listening to it and singing it in the church. Uh, and it tells the heart of the Father as he's pleading, My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? I love that song because it goes on to say, It seems my children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful song with beautiful music and beautiful words, but the message makes you almost want to go, my house is full, and then you get to that part, and it's like, oh, but my field is empty. My children want to come into my synagogue. They want to come into my house of worship. They want to sit around my table, but they don't want to go out, and they don't want to work in my field. You know, a lot of Christians today, they have something that I like to call pew paralysis. Pew paralysis, the condition brought on by an indifferent, careless, and lukewarm disposition. One with pew paralysis is so overly comfortable in their lackadaisical condition that they slip into a spiritual paralytic state to which the gospel message they have been commissioned to share has become stationary and immobile. This person is content in warming a pew every week but thinks it too difficult and challenging to do any personal evangelism beyond the church walls. And pastor, you know, as a pastor, I know that many, many, many years of pastoring, you've seen these type of Christians. They are devoted to anything that's going on within those four walls of a church building, but they are too slow to go out and share the gospel commission that God has given them. Is that you? I hope that's not the case. Because Jesus has given us a powerful commission. He says, do you know me? Do you have a relationship with me? Have I done something good in your life? 
Do you know me and have come to know me on a daily basis? Have I been good to you? Do you have a story that you can go tell someone about me and what I've done for you in your life? That's what the good news is. It doesn't have to be some deep theological breakdown of the book of Daniel or Revelation or some deep theological dividing of the Word of God so that you can showcase how much you know. It can simply be a wonderful, beautiful story in how God has transformed your life, how God has blessed you, how God has bestowed upon you such a power powerful blessing that all you got to do is just go and tell someone when somebody's passing you in the grocery store they may say hi how are you it may be as simply as I'm blessed I am blessed and you know what I respond like that often when somebody says hey brother how are you I can't complain I'm blessed the Lord is good no matter what's going on in your life that's why I love to sing that song also that you know I can't complain it's one of my favorite songs that God is so good to me that I can't complain that is the gospel message that we serve a God who cares we serve a God who loves us indeed even the disciples when they came back from the city cities there in Samaria as Jesus had just completed his conversation with the woman at the well and they come back and they've got the food and they say Jesus we brought lunch and he says that's okay I've, I've got food that you don't even know about and I can imagine as the scripture says they look around what who brought this brother food did he did he pack a lunch and what did Jesus say John 4 34 pastor I think you referenced this before in one of the previous lessons Jesus said to them my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to don't miss this part and to finish his work God wants us to co-labor with him, with all of heaven, with the angels and all the kingdom of God, co-labor with him in helping to finish this work, to send this beautiful gospel commission to all the world. That's a part of the great new covenant message. The part of the great new covenant gospel message is that Jesus is returning soon and he's coming back for a people who are ready. He's coming back for a people who have consecrated themselves to him. He's coming back for a people that he can take to his kingdom, that they can repopulate heaven from all those fallen angels that had fallen he wants to make you a part of that population seventh day adventist i'm a seventh day adventist christian and seventh day adventist christians get their name from a great and mighty work that god did on did all the way back at the beginning in the origins and we started actually this study 13 weeks ago at the origins, talking about the great uh, Sabbath commandment that the Lord had established, all the great work that he had done, but yet he rested on the seventh day. He ceased from doing his work on the seventh day. Seventh day Adventist, what is your commission? It's right there in your very name. Just as God ceased from his work and he finished his work, we also need to rest, but also help the Father finish the work. We need to co-labor with him and help finishing the work. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Are you a spirit-led Christian? Are we filled with the Holy Spirit in these last days? Because the Bible says that one indication of how you know you are full of the Holy Ghost is that you have received power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that you shall be a witness to me, he says, in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and all the uttermost parts of the world, and to all the earth. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you fired up for Jesus to give that gospel commission? Are you fired up for Jesus to tell the world about what he has done for you? I love, I love, love, love evangelism. That's what I live for. It's not something that I do. Evangelism isn't an event on a calendar. Evangelism isn't something that you, you know, circle a particular day on a calendar to say, this day I've set aside to do this. Evangelism is a way of life. It's a way of existence. It's just who I am. It's what I do because I serve a mighty God that I'm not worthy to even loose his sandals. I'm not even worthy to even mention his name, but I'll tell you, his name is Jesus. And Jesus is coming back for a people who are ready. Sixth volume of the testimony, page 295. Someone must fulfill the commission of Christ. Someone must carry on the work which he began to do on earth. And the church has been given this privilege. Don't miss this next point. For this purpose, it has been Organized. Did you catch that? For the purpose of, com of giving the commission of Christ, sharing the gospel. That is why the church has been organized for us to rise up, band together in unity, pick up this word of God and go share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ with the entire world. Woo! Amen. I think, Ryan, I think what Ryan is trying to say <laughs> is that the burden of uselessness and pew paralysis will be resolved when we accept the new covenant and the new mission. Thank you so much mm. for that enthusiastic yeah. Yeah. appeal to those who are right now in this trying hour of Earth's history. There's no need for inactivity. The new covenant 
is calling for a new commitment to the mission of saving souls. Jill, give us a summary of you. This has been a beautiful lesson, oh, it hasn't has. it? Oh, it has. Incredible lesson. What a gift. What a blessing. My lesson Monday was guilt-free. I don't know, maybe you are feeling guilty. Maybe you are feeling that you have wandered far from God and don't know if He can forgive you, if He can restore you. I want to assure you right now that the Lord Jesus loves you and he is extending to you the blood of Jesus. And he says, accept this. I will forgive and cleanse and make you whole. Amen. Amen. Jason. Amen. Now, I don't know if, you know, you know anything about the, the heart transplant list or getting on a donor list, but God wants to give you a new heart. Amen. And he wants to give you, wants you to take advantage of the new covenant. And so if that's your desire today, then I just ask that you would, Ask Christ to come into your life and enjoy the fullness of his joy. Amen. Amen. The Lord is just strongly impressing me that I need to explain a Greek term. And the term is eternal or everlasting. In the Greek, it is Ionius. And it is a relative term. In other words, it is defined by what it is related to, whatever it is uh, explaining, modifying. So when we use everlasting in connection with God and things of God, it means infinitely, without end. But when you use everlasting, like the everlasting fire, and it's talking about it's connected with mortal things or people. That means it's just till it ends. So in Jude 7, Sodom and Gomorrah are a sign of everlasting fire. That's the second death. My house is full. My field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? The Father is calling us. He's commissioned you. Go out into the field. That's right. First Peter, for you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. The proclamation is to go therefore and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into this marvelous, marvelous light. We have enjoyed sharing the covenant. The promises of God is everlasting covenant. But we would like to invite you to join us again next quarter when the lesson study is going to be rest in Christ. Friends, the commission is for you. We pray that you'll accept the new covenant, the Christ of the new covenant, and be a part of that new Jerusalem. God bless you until we see you again. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth interactive study of the Word of God. We're concluding a series today on the promise, God's everlasting covenant. It's been an amazing series. If you've missed any, go to our website, hopetv.org slash hopess, and you can watch the whole series. I know you'll be blessed. Today's topic is a beautiful one, the new covenant life. What does it look like? What are the characteristics of a life that has a living connection mm -hmm. with our great and awesome God? We're glad you're with us, and we pray you'll be blessed. And welcome to our team. Good to be together again, isn't it? Yeah. What a great series. What's the most important lesson we've learned in this series on the God's everlasting covenant? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's how much God loves us, right? Yeah. Yeah. He wants us to he be with Him so and to know His his love for us, mm -hmm. as Jesus said, I pray that they would be with me mm -hmm. where I am. What an amazing promise we have through Jesus, mm -hmm. our Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we do just like the scripture song said. We want to call upon your name, first of all, to bless your name, to give you thanks. You are a great and awesome God. Thank you that you are a God who always keeps your promises. Today, as we study about the new covenant life, I know that that's your desire for each one of us who's joined the study today, that we would experience life and life more abundantly. Mm. So may the Holy Spirit energize us as we read, as we share, and as we join in this in-depth, interactive study of your word. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, if I were to ask you to describe what are some of the 
characteristics of a new covenant life. You say, well, it must be better than, than before you have a living connection with God, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at a few of the characteristics of a new covenant life. That's a life that has entered into this loving, transforming relationship mm -hmm. with God. And uh, maybe you'll say, well, I can think of some others, and we'll catch those at the end. But we're going to start with something Jesus said in John 15, verses 9 through 11. John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. Sabina, if you could begin our study today. These are the words of Jesus, and they give us one characteristic mm -hmm. of a new covenant life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Uh, John chapter 15, verses 9 to 11, and it says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain you, and that your joy may be full. Now, there's a lot of important truth in those words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What are some things, Stephanie, that you hear as you listen to the words of Jesus? That as his Father has loved him, he has loved us. It's all about a relationship with us, right? Yes. He, yeah. he, he doesn't want us to just know about him. No. Yeah. He wants us to know him, mm -hmm. personal living relationship. And, and what is one of the results of that living relationship? That our joy will be full. Yes. Now, we're from different cultures, you know. Some cultures, you know, if you're really joyful, you know, <laughs> right? Yeah. And in other yeah. cultures, it's like, you know, <laughs> some of us are more expressive than others. Yeah. But, but when your joy is full, yes. mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. it's, it's visible, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're going to see it, yeah. Billy? Right. Yeah, I, one way I try to describe it with my friends is that, you know, imagine when you go on vacation, you know, your favorite spot, and you're having just blast. You're not thinking about work. You're not thinking about anything. You're just enjoying the beach. You're just out there having fun. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you need to come back. But imagine having that experience 24-7, mm -hmm. regardless of what's happening. Mm -hmm. This is like that height of joy that God mm -hmm. just wants us to have with Him. Mm -hmm. So, Fullness of joy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, John, who recorded those words of Jesus, mm -hmm. he didn't forget what Jesus said. Look in his first letter to Christians in 1 John. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, if you could take us to 1 John chapter 1, the first four verses. That, that word of Jesus left a deep impression on the Apostle John's mind that mm -hmm. one of the characteristics of a new covenant mm -hmm. life is, is joy, mm -hmm. fullness of joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, mm -hmm. that your joy may be full. Mm -hmm. Why would knowing the truth about Jesus bring us fullness of joy? <laughs> What's the answer? Yes, Travis. Well, because we just read in a previous lesson, learned that it's Jesus that sets us free. So if God mm -hmm. is love, Someone says, if you want to know what God is like, well, the, Jesus said that. Uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If we want to know what God is like, just look at, the, look at the life of Jesus. Well, when we look at the life of Jesus, we see a kind, compassionate, yes. loving God who wants to redeem us from our sins, who wants to take mm -hmm. us through life, who wants to give us joy, who wants to live with us forever. How can you not have joy with somebody like that? Mm -hmm. So... How does, he, how does that joy actually find its way into our hearts? Is, is it worked up? You know, let everything get like, louder and quicker. Yeah. How does that joy find its way into our hearts? Do you know? Well, yes, Stephanie. I, I'm just looking at the verse, the uh, first verse, 
that we've seen with our own eyes, we've looked upon, we've ah, handled uh -huh. concerning the word of life. So you would say that by, now we're not actually there with Jesus like John was, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But by studying the life of Jesus, and as Travis said, seeing what an amazing revelation mm -hmm. of the Father his life was, mm -hmm. um, joy wells up. Yes. But there are some people that read, um, they read the Bible and they go, no, I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. Is it not a supernatural work that we experience yes. that fullness of joy, Sabina? Yes, it's through God's work. It's through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, as you are reading the Bible, you are going to start having your heart change it. And your experiences mm -hmm. will also reflect the presence of God. So at least that's for me how this joy comes. It's in this relationship with God that the Holy Spirit is part of it. For sure, you know, my wife wrote a little scripture song, the fruit of the Spirit is yeah. love, uh -huh. joy. joy. Right. That's the next one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you had love and joy both in that text too, yes. right? Mm -hmm. That you read uh, from mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Love and joy. The Holy Spirit mm -hmm. brings to us the joy yes. of that living relationship with mm -hmm. Jesus. But yes. thank you, Stephanie. It's through spending that personal time mm -hmm. reflecting on Jesus, just as John testified. Mm -hmm. Travis? In, in the first verse we read in John 15, it says, abide, and you can't abide mm -hmm. somewhere where you don't currently reside. Mm -hmm. So you have to go, and the, and the word abide means stay. You want mm -hmm. to stay there. You mm -hmm. want to go there and stay there. Mm -hmm. You want to stay in your relationship with Jesus. It's not like mm -hmm. come and go and get it. When you, you, mm -hmm. when you stay, you will experience that joy. Mm -hmm. You know, that same word to abide or, or to remain is in John 15 mm -hmm. of the branch being grafted mm -hmm. right. into the vine. Abide mm -hmm. in me. So that mm -hmm. ongoing connection, right? Yeah. Not just yeah. a passing connection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we know the love of God, but we also know the joy of God. Yeah. So what would you say to a person? I mean, have you met people who are professed Christians who don't seem that joyful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, sure. So sure. what would you it say? Is, mm -hmm. is it possible that, that they're just having a bad day? Is that possible? Yes. It is. It yeah. can it's be. It's possible. Absolutely. But what if you don't ever see the fullness of joy in, in the person? <laughs> you say, Derek, what about me? What if I don't see the... Yeah. joy of the Lord in me. Mm. Then what do I do, Sabina? Well, Pastor Derek, I think that the Bible and Jesus even alerted us to the fact that we were going to go through tribulations. And even when we look at the, the book of Psalms and David, he had so many difficult experiences, but he speaks, for instance, on Psalms 23, which is such a famous Psalm, how he could even pass through the, you know, to the valley of death and knowing that God is there with him, that he would have a banquet uh, in front of him. So that's how I relate with suffering and also eventually encountering Christians who may not be that joyful. They may be going to that valley, but for sure, like if you have that conviction that God is with you and in your experience and walk with him, you know that there is a banquet ahead. And he does say, my cup runs over, surely goodness and mercy. He starts getting a little joyful at the end yes. of the song, doesn't he? he does. As he turns his attention away from Wrong. the dark valley, to, yeah. Jesus, to, to the God, house of the Lord, the Lord, right? Yeah. Can you share a time in your experience mm. when you mm. caught a glimpse of, of the fullness of joy that's ours in the Lord? Mm. I, I guess I'm hearing that that's mm. not going to be every day, though it ought to really undergird our whole life experience. The joy of the Lord is our strength, mm. right? Mm. That's right. Someone share a time. Maybe you were on a mission assignment or maybe you were in a mm. worship experience. You just felt the joy of the Lord. Mm. Sabina? I can think of when my niece was born. <laughs> I'm not a mother, I don't, I'm not married, but I have a niece and I was so joyful when I saw her coming into life. I know this is maybe a simple experience to many people, but if you have a child or someone in your family, I think you have shared this joy as well. And how old were you, if you don't mind me asking, when the baby um, was born? This was about 12 years ago. I was on my 20s, like early 20s. Okay, yeah. so so you were certainly very old enough to see everything and understand what was happening. Yeah. And you felt the joy of that new life. Exactly. And recognizing also God as creator and ah. the, the one who gives life. It was a spiritual life. experience. It was, absolutely. It mm -hmm. was the encounter of, with life that is always being renewed by God's power. For so me, when we experience special. that kind of joy yeah. in our lives, what should we do? Celebrate. <laughs> Celebrate and share. 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 
Great. Thank you, God. Amen. God, yes. Right? Thank you. Thank you, God. That's one of the uh, mm -hmm. fruit, I guess, yeah. of this new covenant life, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. That your joy may be full. Travis? Mm -hmm. So we were, uh, we were do building churches in Malawi, Africa, and putting roofs on. And so we drove many hours through these trails, get back, we're building this church. And while we're building this church, a group mm -hmm. of women that came there, and they were serenading us in song. While we're putting this roof on the church, we had tears in our eyes, we're building, and they just continued to <laughs> sing and sing, and they were so happy that they were getting a church and a roof. Wow. And uh, at the, we were all in tears when we left that day because we had met such a beautiful group of people, mm -hmm. you know. But it brought joy to all of our hearts. We recognized, you know, that they were just so happy. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, it was. Now, amazing. I don't know. When I was in Kenya, they, they would move while they sang. Yeah. They, Did yes. they do that too? They were happy. Not just yeah. like this, right? Yes, exactly. So they were happy celebrating what God's doing through your ministry, mm -hmm. putting a roof on their church. But you were experiencing the joy of the Lord. Oh, too. it was amazing. Mm -hmm. If we just took this one characteristic, we'd say, mm -hmm. that's important. But there are some other characteristics mm -hmm. we want to look at. Mm -hmm. A second one is experiencing freedom mm -hmm. from the guilt of mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 8. Jason, if you could take us to verse 1 of Romans 8. Another characteristic of this new covenant life is freedom freedom from the guilt of mm. sin. What does mm. the Apostle Paul declare in chapter 8, mm -hmm. verse 1 of Romans? I have the New King James Version here. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Mm. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, I, this is confession time. Don't give me any specifics, mm. please. But have you ever felt condemned because of your sin? Mm -hmm. yeah. Guilty. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. How does that feel? Not good. Not good. No. <laughs> Not good. That could really hinder the joy of the Lord, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So God wants to set you free from that mm -hmm. guilt. Mm -hmm. By the way, guilt is not a bad thing. Guilt lets it's you know that you're off track, yeah, right? right. True. But freedom from the weight of that guilt, mm -hmm. that condemnation, mm -hmm. uh, and to set you free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. How can a just and holy God do that? Because you deserve to be feeling guilty. Mm. You transgress the law of a holy God. Mm. How can he do that and still be just? <laughs> it's called amazing grace, but exactly. tell me about it. Yes. Travis. I was thinking in Romans, the wages yeah. of sin is death. It's something we've earned, like you said. Mm -hmm. But the gift of God, he's giving it to us. You're right. We don't. You know how he can do it? because he paid the price yes. and he has the authority to give it to us. Yeah. So if I keep walking around, Stephanie, maybe you've heard people, sometimes I'm shocked, people are still burdened down by something mm -hmm. that they committed 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, they're carrying it like a backpack, heavy. Mm -hmm. wow. um, God doesn't want that, right? No. Mm -hmm. In the new covenant life, he wants us not only to experience fullness of joy, yeah. but freedom from the guilt of sin. Yeah. Um, how can I help a person that's feeling, they say, oh, well, Stephanie, I, I've asked to be forgiven, but I still feel defiled. I still feel mm -hmm. dirty. Mm -hmm. I just have that weight of guilt on me. What would you say to her? I would definitely be praying for that person because I think the Holy Spirit would need to give me guidance as I speak, um, but I would try to point, point her to Jesus, mm. who is, he says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And what God says is what he does. So we can trust that, but I think it's, it's really having a building, um, mm -hmm. that person needs to have a stronger and, um, relationship and trust in God. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have to. Mm -hmm. Each maybe, one of us struggles. And maybe go back to the Gospels where you see mm -hmm. stories like John 8, I don't condemn you, go and sin mm -hmm. no more, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you quoted a text that you've hidden it in your heart, 1 John 1 verse 9. Yes. And uh, maybe we should read it again because I think if you ask people, can, can God forgive your sins? But there's something else that God wants mm. to do that you quoted there in 1 John. Mm -hmm. Billy, do you have that verse, 1 John 1 
and verse 9. I okay. just am impressed that we should read it. It mm. uh, was quoted to us by Stephanie. Sure, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Well, there's another verb mm. that's used here in the English translation. Not only cl or cleanse is one possible word. Another mm. one is purify. purify. Mm. You say, boy, I'm pure again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that's a miracle. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. <laughs> yeah. I'm clean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. By the grace of God, that mm -hmm. condemnation is taken away. Mm -hmm. And how does a, a just God do that? Mm -hmm. Christ mm -hmm. bore our condemnation, mm -hmm. exactly. right? right? Yes. He bore our sin mm -hmm. and offered us not only forgiveness, but mm -hmm. cleansing. Yeah. Yeah. Cleansing, yes. a, a new covenant life, free. Mm -hmm. yes. You say, well, I'm, I'm happy now. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> when the devil tells me things I did in the past, mm -hmm. yeah. I can say, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I've been set free the, from the condemnation that mm -hmm. I deserved. Amen. Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Yes. John chapter 5, verse 24 is a beautiful promise of Jesus. John chapter 5. Jason, do you have it? Verse 24. Uh, this, this is a wonderful passage. It even goes on to talk about the resurrection. Mm -hmm. You know, the dead in Christ are going to rise. It's a powerful passage. Mm -hmm. But uh, look at verse 24 of John 5. Have the New King James Version here. John chapter 5, verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, mm -hmm. but has passed from death into life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That tells me, by the way, there is a final judgment. It's mm -hmm. clearly taught in scripture, mm -hmm. but it's telling me mm -hmm. that the the outcome's already settled for the person who's accepted Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah. really Praise God. Praise, Praise God. God. Yeah. Yes. The outcome's already settled mm -hmm. yes. because yeah. I stand yeah. under the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. It's a beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. promise. Yeah. I'm going to experience freedom mm -hmm. uh, from condemnation. Before mm -hmm. that, I said fullness of joy. Right. Yeah, amen. But, but I'm also going to experience the love of God Mm -hmm. like never before. Billy, in a previous mm -hmm. study, you were quoting from memory from Ephesians chapter 3. Right. But would you read that for us in our study today? Sure. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, let's read the whole passage if you can. It's so beautiful. Verses 14 through 21. Because I believe that one of the characteristics of a new covenant life is not only fullness of joy and freedom from condemnation, but mm -hmm. it's experiencing the love of God mm -hmm. like never before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does the Apostle Paul express that in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21? Sure, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and his inner being, so that Christ may dwell in you, in your heart, through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, mm -hmm. may have power, together mm -hmm. with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep mm -hmm. is the love of Christ, mm -hmm. wow. and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Mm -hmm. mm. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than mm. all we ask or imagine according mm. to his power that is at work within us, to mm. him be glory in the, in the church and in Christ Jesus mm. throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What impacts you the most as mm. you listen? Th th those words are given by inspiration mm. of God, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. This isn't just Paul writing. Mm -hmm. Holy men of God mm -hmm. spoke mm -hmm. as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. right? What impacts you the most, Stephanie, as you hear these? It's like he's, he's wrestling <laughs> with trying to describe the, the breadth and depth, the height mm -hmm. of the love of God. To him who is able to do, he's, he's able to do exceedingly mm -hmm. and abundantly above all that you can ask or think, mm -hmm. according to the power that works in him. Mm -hmm. That really impacted you. Yes. Yeah. He's able. He's able mm -hmm. 
to do all of that and more. Mm. All right. Mm. Sabina, what impacted you as you heard those words? I think that what impacts me the most here, Pastor Derek, on verse 19, it's when it says that the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. Mm. So mm. we can't ever grasp or comprehend the dimension of this love, even as a Christian, when I feel like I have experienced enough experiences in which I've seen God's love towards me, my family, or friends, and for me it's already reason for joy and fulfillment. But then still the Bible is telling me that His love surpasses my knowledge, so there is there might be much more. <laughs> Maybe eternity to exactly, yeah. understand and then just beginning mm. to understand the uh -huh, love of God. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, we talked about how um, that joy of the Lord comes to us by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you know the love of the of God also is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where where is that found? Is it, is there a text that mm -hmm. talks about the, God's love is poured mm -hmm. into our hearts? Mm -hmm. Jason, I see you nodding. Where where is that found? That's Romans five five. Romans chapter five. Would you read that for us? And verse five. So does that mean? Uh, by the way, Jesus did say ask. Does that mean we can ask day by day for the love of God to be poured into our hearts? Mm. Mm. That's part of the new covenant life. <laughs> mm. well, I'm we joyful and I'm free from condemnation and, and I'm filled with the love of God. How does that read in Romans mm. 5, 5? Romans chapter 5, verse 5, New King James Version says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy yeah. Spirit who was given to us. Mm -hmm. Now, if we just took that, we could say, oh, that's wonderful. I'm just going to experience the love of mm -hmm. God like never before. And that's good. Mm -hmm. But look at another truth in John 7, where Jesus is talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who brings to us a deeper experience of the love of God. John 7, verses 37 to 39. Travis, could you read that for us? Mm-hmm. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Mm. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. But when the Holy Spirit was poured out and we are filled with the Holy Spirit who brings the love of God, what happens? What did, what did it say? It passes through. That's right. Yes. It's like it's not something that Over. we even want to uh, restrict. Mm -hmm. Correct. But out of us flows Rivers. a river of living water. Wow. The love of God wow. flowing. <laughs> that passes all knowledge, yes. is flowing through us. Wow. The new covenant life is not just about experiencing the love of God. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. The new covenant life is about what? Sharing it. It's sharing. about sharing the love of God. You say, Billy, that's really practical. You work <laughs> for a development and relief agency called ADRA. Mm -hmm. It's not about just saying, oh, God, you love me so much. That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it's more than that. It's, yeah. it's actually, you know, being able to give. What I, what I found most, um, uh, uh, the best thing about my, my, my job is, yes, you know, people give them food, give them water. But what I found most rewarding is when they get hope mm -hmm. in the fact that we serve a God who can provide. And the people are, so it's very interesting that Jesus is using the word like thirsty. So mm. People are really thirsty for hope. Mm. They are really thirsty f f uh, to know that you know they can make it to the next day and things are going to get better. So, as much as we can give them water and food, yes, that that's that's okay. But when we give them the hope that hey, you know there is a God who's going to give justice. There is a God who's going to uh, make things right. That you who lost your loved one, He's going to make make that right. He's mm. He's going to fix things. He's a fixer. Mm. He's a healer. It, mm. They get that life and that hope that you know what I think there is things going to get better. And sometimes people crave that more than maybe just the food that you give them and the little mm. things that you give them. Yeah. Mm. We give them the love of God. Mm. Perfect. Mm. Poured mm. into our hearts by the Holy mm. Spirit, mm. right? Yeah. Can you think of someone in, either in your own life experience or maybe a Bible character where you see the love of God? This is mm. the new covenant life, by the way, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Not only fullness of joy and 
freedom from guilt, but the love of God is being mm. poured through that person. Mm. Um, maybe someone you say, yep, she lives next door, or it may mm. be no, that I'm thinking of a New Testament Bible character, mm. you know, who's, who's really, you see the love of God being poured through that person. Somebody mm. come to mind, Stephanie? Yeah, I was thinking of a friend of mine in Florida, and Dina has, she, it doesn't matter whether she knows the person or not. Um, I called her up and said, can you help? I have a friend who's not feeling well and she needs someone. And mm. she was right over there and spent the entire day with her mm. and prayed with her. And you know that it, it's unselfish commitment to doing whatever God calls to do, mm. being ready. <laughs> mm. To let the love of God yes. flow through. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's quite a, it's a remarkable witness, isn't it? It is. Mm -hmm. When the yeah. love of God. Anybody yeah. else? Can you think of either someone in real life now or a Bible character? Yes, Pastor Sabine? Derek, I'm just thinking about something that happened yesterday with a friend of mine. They were sharing with me that their water heater broke in their house. And the house is new. It's the first time they are, you know, encountering this issue in a new city that they are living. And they called a friend of them that works with them in the church. And this person who lives about two hours away from them is coming today <laughs> to help them fix the water heater because he's a plumber. And he simply made that out of like a good heart and knowing that, you know, God loves him so much. He's just making that as a gift to them. So for me, this mm -hmm. is also an evidence of God's love poured in their lives through the life of this other person who has received this love from God and the Holy Spirit. So I'm excited for them. I know for them it's very important. And that's a beautiful yeah. testament because it just happened yesterday and today, right? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what came to my mind just from the Bible was this lady named uh, Tabitha, yeah. also mm -hmm. called Dorcas, yeah. yes. sewing clothes, and she dies, and they're weeping. They're bringing clothes. You know, it's like the love of God was pouring through her. Mm -hmm. And, of course, yeah. you know the end of that story in Acts yes. chapter 8 yeah. that she's raised from the dead, right? Yes. It's like, mm -hmm. wow. Uh, amazing, uh, but but it's a wonderful thing when we see the love of God being mm. poured through a person's life. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you know that God wants that to happen through mm. you and through me? Mm -hmm. That's part of that new covenant life, mm -hmm. yeah. experiencing fullness of joy, freedom from condemnation, mm -hmm. not only experiencing the love of God more deeply, mm -hmm. but allowing His love to right. flow through yes. us. Share a time when you experienced that, when mm -hmm. you were the recipient of the love of God being poured through yeah. someone um, mm. to bless your life. Does yeah. anyone have an experience that comes to mind? Mm. We should all be going, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. But, but you know, yeah. it's not as co common as God would want it to be, is it? Mm. That uh, stepping aside and just letting yeah. the love of God pour through us. Sabina? I do have many examples that I can think of, primarily from my family, right? My parents. I think that parents usually or should be the primary people that represent this type of love towards us. But I'll give you another example. It's not going to be from my family. It's a friend um, who has recently helped me move all my things that I had from a city to another and drive 10 hours uh, truck. Uh, and for me up to now, it's very impressive on my heart, this love that this person showed to me because she had to work. She had to take care of her own dog and other things that she had to do. But still, she took three days of her busy week just to help me move all my things and drive this truck so that I wouldn't do that by my own. And that, for me, is really like an evidence of God's love in her life. And to me, it was... It sounds very practical, yeah. right? Yes. Travis, I saw your hand. Yeah. Well, I, I remember when I was first, um, mm -hmm. some church members paid for me to go on a mission, the very first mission trip. It's actually the, mm -hmm. the one that started, you know, to change my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was there, and I, I was smoking cigarettes yet, and uh, maybe chewing tobacco, and you know, doing things like that, and, and even would curse, you know. I wasn't a mm -hmm. uh, church-going Christian, you know, Bible-believing Christian, a uh, practicing one at that time, but I went. So you were invited to go on a mission trip yeah. mm -hmm. that you were going to see the love of God, but you were definitely uh, a work in progress. Right, but I knew that I shouldn't do any of these things on the trip, and, and so I didn't bring anything along or, you know, but I'm, I remember we're eating for, for we're building a mission house, and I'm, we're cleaning up beans to eat out in the jungle, you know, cleaning them up, and I said a, I said a bad word, mm -hmm. and I thought, they're going to 
kick me out of here. I am gone. And I looked over, his name was Judd, and he looked at me, and he just gave me a smile. And it was a, he had love in his eyes. It was a forgiving smile, and I knew, okay, I know that I shouldn't have done that, but I'm safe. These guys are safe, and they're not going to condemn me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that impacted me. Even just something small like that impacted me. I realized that mm. this is a group of people that love me and are going to work with me along my journey. Mm. Wow. Beautiful testimony. Yeah. Well, if we just took these characteristics, and by the way, you may be saying, okay, should be experiencing fullness of joy, <laughs> mm -hmm. freedom from condemnation, yeah. guilt, and uh, experiencing the love of God and letting the love of God flow through me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord, <laughs> that should take me to my knees every day, right? Yes. But yeah. another characteristic of this covenant, new covenant life is a wonderful assurance mm. of salvation. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful That's assurance powerful. of salvation. Let's look at a few verses that reinforce that, shall we? John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus is speaking at the graveside mm. of someone named Lazarus, mm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. mm. But he has something to say about life and mm. new life. Oh. Stephanie, would you read John 11, 25 and 26? Sure, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So there's a challenge here because her mm -hmm. brother has just died. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, he believed in Jesus as mm -hmm. the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So how is it that people can die, and yet Jesus says, you'll never die? Mm -hmm. Is there one death that is temporary yeah. and another death that is mm -hmm. permanent? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see what Jesus says. Let's look in John chapter 6, verses 39 and 40. Jason, if you have it, John 6, 39 and 40. We're just actually reading the words of Jesus here because Jesus is the resurrection and mm. the life, right? Mm -hmm. I have the New King James Version here. John chapter 6, verses 39 and 40. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Mm -hmm. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. Mm. Two times, I will raise Him up. That means even mm. if they fall asleep mm. in the first death, mm -hmm. they're not going to stay asleep, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. right? There's going to be a resurrection. resurrection. Re let's look again in John 5, verses 28 and 29. Stephanie, if you could read that for sure. us. The New King James Version says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, a careful study of the book of Revelation mm -hmm. will show that there are two resurrections there. Mm -hmm. and they're separated by... A thousand years, actually. Mm -hmm. That's in Revelation 20. Yeah. But what's most important is we want to rise in the resurrection of the living, the, the, living. Righteous, the righteous, not of the, resur the yes. resurrection of condemnation, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. We want to rise up as those who've fallen asleep, trusting mm -hmm. in Jesus mm -hmm. as our Savior. Mm -hmm. Is there another Bible text that comes to your mind, not by Jesus now, but one of the apostles, that speaks about this resurrection of mm -hmm. those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, mm -hmm. chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. First Thessalonians, chapter 4. I'm looking, seeing pages turn here. Sabina, do you have it? Yes. Chapter 4 of First Thessalonians, beginning with verse 13 down through verse 18. Okay. So I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says... But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So when does eternal life begin? Does it begin after, assuming we've fallen asleep mm. in death, when we're raised in the resurrection when Jesus comes? When does eternal life begin, Travis? If we have Jesus, we're, we have eternal life now. Mm -hmm. Even if we fall asleep for a, That's right. a short yeah. sleep. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. Anybody agree, disagree? I have come that they may have life right. and have it more, abundant. more, more abundant. abundantly. That's a present experience. Yes. yes. So how does it affect you with the trials that we face in life, right? Mm -hmm. we, we live in a broken world mm -hmm. to know mm -hmm. that you have the assurance even today mm -hmm. of, that, mm -hmm. of that eternal life. Sabina? Pastor Derek, for me, it changes everything. <laughs> you know, all my entire perspective of life, of goals, of meaning, of purpose is changed by the realization that God, that God made me for eternity and not for here. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that many of us, uh, if not all of us actually, we do everything in our lives actually thinking of the day we are going to die. You know, the time frame that we have considering your wedding, considering your, your marriage, considering your work, the upbringing of a child will always be based on the fact that there will be a day in which we're going to die. But if you have in your heart the certainty that this life here is just a part of eternity, then all those other things that appear to be a hindrance to you, you gain a new perspective. You know, even your work, when you are doing work, you are not going to think of a work that is going to vanish soon, but it's a work that can bring results for eternity. And I can think of that in every area of my life, how it affects. And certainly when I learned about this truth here, it changed even my purpose as what I was going to go and do with my life in each one of my days while I'm here, you know. It begins right now. That's yeah. a powerful testimony. Billy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm, I, I love history. And one thing that I find out in history is that people use death or people in command use death to force you know, the, the, the people that they have uh, power over to force them to do things that they would not normally do. Mm -hmm. So death is used as a tool to force people to do anything. And like the threat of death, you mm -hmm. mean? Yeah. Is used like a weapon? As a weapon. Like if you don't do this, I'll kill yeah, you. I'll that kill sounds you. like the devil, by the mm -hmm. way, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. Yes? So imagine if, if, if you know that, hey, you know, if I have Christ, I have eternal life. So yes, you know, you may kill me, but you won't kill my soul in the sense where, you know, God will, will raise me up again. So mm -hmm. that fear is gone mm -hmm. that death does not have, you know, entire power over me, that mm -hmm. even if somebody forced me to do something that I mm -hmm. know should not be done, then I, I'll be able to stand up for what is right and what is, um, and, and also, you know, do what is right. So uh, I think it's very important to know that the fear of the threat of death when it's gone it can it it liberates you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. oh death where is your sting mm. grave. Yeah. oh grave, grave where is your victory is right victory, yeah. yeah thanks be to god who gives me the victory through jesus christ yeah Amen. so if someone says renounce jesus or i'm going to kill you mm. that's the weapon they're using right, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. of death mm -hmm. you know the what's the answer Nope. You can kill me, but I'll take Jesus. <laughs> you, you cannot terminate right. my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may cause me to stop breathing here, mm -hmm. but I have the assurance of an eternal life Amen. with God. Yes. Right. Amen. I know, what did Paul say? I know whom I have believed. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I am persuaded, persuaded, persuaded that he is able, able. He's able, able to keep that which I've committed yeah. to him. Mm -hmm. And what have I committed to him? My life. My whole life. Yes. And my, yes. my destiny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's able to keep yes. that which I've committed yeah. to him against mm -hmm. that day. That mm -hmm. assurance of eternal life mm -hmm. is something that mm -hmm. no one and nothing
can take away from mm, us. Right. Amen. You say, Derek, there's a lot of wonderful characteristics of a new covenant life, right? Mm -hmm. Fullness of joy, freedom from guilt, experiencing mm -hmm. the love of God and sharing the love of God, having the assurance of eternal life. But, but there's a, a fifth characteristic I'd like us to close with in our study. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhat related to the third one of not only experiencing the love of God, mm -hmm. but sharing the love of God. Mm -hmm. okay. But it, it, it's sharing something else. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's the love of God too. That's why I say they're related. Mm -hmm. But sharing the good news, mm -hmm. sharing the gospel message mm -hmm. is a characteristic mm -hmm. of the new covenant life. Mm -hmm. It's not like, well, that's just something that mm -hmm. Billy does mm -hmm. or that's something that Stephanie does. No, mm -hmm. everyone who's experiencing the new mm -hmm. covenant life, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll share the good news. Let's look in Matthew chapter 28. Mm -hmm. verses 19 and 20. Travis, if you have that, would read it for us. And by the way, it ends by saying, even to the end of the age, mm -hmm. which means it's not just talking to his followers back then. Mm -hmm. It's all mm -hmm. of us, right? Mm -hmm. How does the word of Jesus read there in Matthew 28? And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Now, the amazing thing about Jesus, when he asks us to do something, mm -hmm. which will be a blessing to other people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we will also be blessed. Amen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When we let the love of God flow through us, mm -hmm. we're also blessed as the yeah. love of God passes through us. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we share the gospel message mm -hmm. and the hearer, has tears in his eyes, mm. yeah. and we're also blessed, right? Yes, mm -hmm. So in the minutes that are remaining, let's share some testimony. Maybe people are listening and saying, mm. does it really make a difference? And the answer is yes. Mm. <laughs> that new covenant life makes a difference. Mm. Share a time when you were blessed mm. as you shared the gospel message with someone mm. else. Maybe you were speaking to a large crowd in Malawi. Maybe you were speaking to one person mm at work, but a time when you felt blessed as you shared the gospel message with someone else. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to share? Stephanie? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about a group of us who were doing some evangelistic um, seminars, and there was one person who came in to the series, mm -hmm. and he was saying, no, I've, done, I've gone too far, and I've done more than what God can forgive. Was this, by the way, in America? It was. Okay. It was. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I share with him some of the Bible promises that we have, that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And to? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And mm -hmm. he, he actually didn't come back for a while. And then we just prayed every night. Every night we prayed for this gentleman. And um, toward the end of the series, he walked in the front door. And mm -hmm. um, I understand he is actively involved now, but it was a group of those of us who were praying and um, individuals in the church who are very involved in um, speaking to him personally. And I just think, you know, that's where the joy comes, right? Mm -hmm. Is when you, when you see the fruits of what God's done mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. human, beings, human beings like us who are weak and feeble. Mm. I just realized it takes us back to the experiencing fullness of joy. That's it's right. like it keeps on going, doesn't it? Yes. As we live that new covenant life. Yes. Yeah. And by the way, for those of you who couldn't see, Stephanie was smiling while she was talking <laughs> about this man showed up again. Yeah. <laughs> what a miracle of God. Mm. Sabina, do you have an experience where sharing yeah. that good news, mm -hmm. uh, you were blessed in the process? Absolutely. You know, Pastor Derek, like Stephanie, I've had the opportunity to participate in some missionary activities and outreach events. But I think that one that really impacted my life was when I had the chance to live for some years in Uganda. Mm. Some years, I'm sorry, some months in Uganda. I was there for half a, a little more than half a year. And we, every week we would visit slums and places where people needed to hear the message. And I remember of a family, which was a family who was very, very poor and, um, very unfortunately, they didn't have much. But the joy came so strong to me, Pastor Derek, because, you know, they, they barely could read. Mm -hmm. And we had the chance to study with them for a few weeks, and they started coming to church. 
and bringing their kids. And eventually, you know, the kids were deciding just to participate every activity of the church. They were engaging, engaging. And I don't know how they are right now, but at this moment when I saw the transformation of the place of isolation where they were, and all of a sudden they were connected to a church group that were so close to them and now could help them to provide for education even, help them to adjust for the needs that they had. For me, it was such a great joy. I was just a little piece in that process. I removed my, myself from the country. I'm no longer there in Uganda, but I'm sure that they have a way to connect mm -hmm. with that church and that this was making a difference for them. It was mm -hmm. wonderful. Amen. Yeah. That's beautiful. Billy. Yes, um, mm -hmm. back uh, where I grew up, uh, I went out with a friend of mine and uh, typically, let's say, on, on a weekly basis, you know, we would go out and then feed on the homeless. And uh, my friend was visiting Boston where I grew up. Um, uh, she decided to come along. And I'm having fun. I'm meeting uh, 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 those who are homeless. And I'm, you know, I'm asking them, what do you need? They're like, you know, I'm hungry. Can you grab me some food? So I'll go to McDonald's, grab, grab them food, come back. I'm having a blast. And I'm hearing their stories. I'm talking to them. And then my friend just like, shocked and uh, uh, she, she's shaking. I said, why are you shaking? She said, this lady just told you that she got raped like two days ago. Mm. And you're, I mean, you are just, you're not even thinking about, I'm like, I'm thinking about, but I'm here to help her. It's be basically the, since I've been so much around her that she hasn't been exposed to how bad the, the streets are. And since I'm always around them, it's not, it's something that I hear, but also I know what they need. And it's that, that touch this handshake, this time that I'm spending with them, th this prayer mm -hmm. that I'm giving with them. So all that experience and, um, and I'm, I'm, so at the end of the day, I said, I'm, I'm having a, you know, this is a great day because I'm able to help somebody who just had a, tra a traumatic experience the night before and she was not the only one. Mm -hmm. There were so many other ones. So my friend was, was shook, she was shaken. She said, how, how can you process that in, in a day? And I said, that's basically, that's the exposure maybe a, a month, not a month, a year or two years afterwards, I heard that she's volunteering at a home, at, at, a, at a center uh, near a school that helps people who, who uh, went through that. And that person is actually Shana. She's one of the Sabbath school members. And it, the joy that I see is that, you know, that transformer that, you know, she changed, I think, a career path to help those who have been abused, those who have been homeless. And now she's also comfortable in that, in that Area. So you know what's amazing? Me. This new covenant life is not just about us having a better life, <laughs> is it? That's yeah. right. Not it's about <laughs> letting others around us experience that yeah. new mm -hmm. life in mm -hmm. Jesus. Yes, freedom from guilt yeah. and joy mm -hmm. and love of God and mm -hmm. assurance of eternal life, mm -hmm. but sharing that mm -hmm. with those around us. Oh, my friends, if you've been inspired today, Mm -hmm. You say, oh, God, could you use me like that? Mm -hmm. You know what will happen if you surrender and ask God to use you? He will. You will be blessed. Mm -hmm. That new covenant life will be yours day by day. Mm -hmm. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer as we bow our heads just now. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, you've got such an amazing plan for us. And it's not just about taking care of us. It's about us joining you in your mission that others too might experience fullness of life. Mm -hmm. God, thank you for your unfailing love. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your mercy, your forgiveness, your, your, your blessings to us beyond number. May we share those blessings and point people to you. In Jesus' name.